welcome to another edition of your program, Harona, and I am Harona Drame. Today, my special guest is Mr. Nyang Njai. Nyang, uh, you know the rules, you know how we do this show, you are not new to television. So we'll begin from your days in Banjul, I suppose, that's where you were born. Well, I was born across the river. I was born at Westfield Clinic. Okay. And um, raised in Banjul for a while because um, I'm told mm -hmm. immediately after I was conceived, about a few months, my parents left for the UK for school or to finish their education rather. Mm -hmm. So yes, I was with my grandparents mm -hmm. on my mom's side for a brief period, maybe about three to five years. Mm -hmm. And later I moved back to the combos when my parents returned. So you, you, you had a brief childhood in Banjul? Oh, definitely. So you are a combo Banjul child? No. In between? Or you want to refer to yourself as a Banjulian? I am a Banjulian, two and through. What are your memories of childhood growing up? Uh, I assume your grandparents looked after you for a while. For a while, but I can't remember much of that period. It was too early. But my, uh, my recollection of Banjul started when I was at... MPK, Methodist Preparatory, Methodist Kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And um, being at MPK, you know, after school, I have to go and wait for my parents, playing on the drains, the gutters of Banjul. Then the gutters were clean, the streets were clean. Mm -hmm. And it was a fun and filled memory as a child growing up in the city of Banjul. Coming back to the combos, do you always want to go for weekends in Banjul? I, I know a lot of people in the combos now like going around Christmas. Uh, hunting, they call it. I, I, I don't know Banjul life. You, you have to excuse my ignorance. Banjul is a close-knit society. A society where economics and ethnic um, identity wasn't strong. Because in Banjul, you have the houses, you have the... Creoles, you have the Wolofs, you have the Bambaras, you have the Cereals, you have the Mandinkas. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it was a fused society. Mm -hmm. And there were very strong cultures, the cultures of Kumpo, Famara, Esamayo, Agugu, Pakin, Kankurang. All of these things were prominent. Fanal, Lantin. So mm -hmm. it's a diverse place with a diverse mix of cultures that makes up Senec um, West Africa. And all these things were just visible in Banjul, and the Banjulians were very tolerant people. I can see later on in your life how this has impacted you, but we'll get to that later in the interview. Um, what games did you play? I mean, a, a lot child, of Gambians play the four corners, uh, basketball, hockey. I mean, which, which games did you play? Okay, as up? a child, I think there's been a progression in my life. My early days, Tic Touch was my thing. Ah, with, with the lead of this uh, soft drink, yeah. Julpal, uh, Jul Malta. Exactly, yes. and yes. a baobab um, seed as the football. Baobab seed or was both. it? Sedem and baobab seed. Sedem, yes. We've, we've used both. Yes. So it was something that I, it was a hobby for a period. Then uh, my latter days at primary school heading to high school, basketball and volleyball became my sport. Later on, table tennis. But I was never into football, even though most of my friends were into football. But football has never been my thing to date. Why not? It's just not a sport that I like, and it was something that I didn't gravitate to. You still wouldn't do it. I mean, table tennis, tic-tac, you seem to be an indoor kind of games person. Not really. Well, I like golf. Outdoor, yeah. I go outside, play golf. But um, the thing, it's not about... It's a contact sport. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm scared of the contact, but it was just not something that I gravitated towards as a child. What were your earlier memories of a chosen profession? Did you, do you remember your first impact of saying, aha, this is it, this is the one I want to be? See, the first thing I had in mind was law. Why? I grew up around prominent lawyers, mm -hmm. Lawyer Dabo being one of them, and way before Lawyer Dabo, P.S. Njai, Mm -hmm. I heard of the exploits of people like lawyer Drame. So mm -hmm. seeing them with their wigs. The senior, Al Haji. Their, yeah, Al Haji. Drame. Seeing them with their wigs, their duffel bags, it was something I liked because I liked fashion and I saw fashion in it. But after a while, there was a 
new breed of Gambians coming in, the Lamin Barros, the Efals, the Ablai Toure's. Mm -hmm. Then I said, you know what? I want to be an economist because these people were doing great things at the NIB. And I was young and the I National aspired. National Investment Board. Exactly. I aspired to be like those people. And that's when my mind was made up exactly what I'm going to do in life. Briefly, can you tell us, because a lot of young people I speak to don't remember NIB. I mean, you have to know, and I appreciate the fact that it's been such a long time. I, I, I remember it vividly because I went to St. Augustine's and these things, uh, the institution was there and it was new. The building was new Well, when they eventually moved into it. And I remembered Ablai Toure heading it. I remember the likes of the Lamin Manjangs, mm -hmm. both of them, the Lamin Manjang, Mohammed Manjang, both of them were there and several others. Yeah. What was, do you remember why it was set up in the first instance? Well, the NIB first used to be at, um, I think we called that place Russell Street, mm -hmm. um, the same street that Gambia Airways used to be, the Modu Musa Memorial, mm -hmm. before you hit um, the current GRA. Mm -hmm. That's where they were and later on they had a building right. at Independence Drive. NIB is equivalent to what Gaipa is today. Mm -hmm. National Investment Board, basically, they promoted investment. They looked at investments that were coming in the Gambia, did appraisals, and gave out incentives. I think um, if you look at Gambians today in the diaspora who are doing well in international organizations, especially in the field of economics and business, most of them are uh, products NIB. of NIB. So NIB... Yeah was just a powerhouse, a brain trust. Mm -hmm. And a lot of great things happened in that place. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think we really didn't continue where they left off. Had it been that people did what NIB did, I mm -hmm. think the business environment and the business culture in this country would have been miles apart today. I agree with you. Now, so you decided to go economics, it was, and law would have taken a back seat. Um, your first jobs, your first experience, in the second segment we'll talk about uh, the schools you went to and uh, your professional life, but we'll, we'll touch a little bit on uh, the first job you had done as an economist. All right, the first job I did as an economist was what you call a back office job. I worked at Chase Financial mm -hmm. in the US and basically what I did was I was in the back supporting brokers who were doing brokerage and all I did was I will do regressions for them I'll do analysis for them that was my first job and that wasn't a policy job that was more of an analytical job data mainly not data just looking at the data looking at trends everything else but um, my first real contact with public policy is when I worked for the government in the Gambia that's when I started doing fiscal management. And for me, that is pure economics. Pure economics. We'll take our first break here. When we come back, more with Nyang Njai. Package drinking water gets the best out of you. Welcome back to Harona, Mr. Nyang Jai. Thank you. Growing up in Banjul, the combos, and uh, higher education. Did you go to Gambia High School or St. Augustine's? Because, you know, most, most gentlemen had to go to St. Augustine's. <laughs> well, unfortunately... <laughs> I have a view that's to the contrary. I think the most refined school 
is Gambia High School. And the only unfortunate product we that came agree. out of Gambia High School is Yaya Jame. I mean, he put a stain on the school, but other than that, great students emanated from that glorious school called the Gambia High School. Okay, so you did go to girls' high school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you did the arts, I assume. Yes. Leaving the Gambia for higher education, I mean, uh, a lot of Gambians would go to the US, UK, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, now everywhere around the world. Why did you choose the US? Well, um, traditionally, my parents had a British education, mm -hmm. which I don't have qualms with, nor do I have a prejudice against. Mm -hmm. But as a child, I was fascinated with the US Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, the lifestyle and everything. So U.S. was just the right place for me to go to school. And U.S., you did go. Which state? I did my schooling at um, Alabama, Jacksonville State University, mm -hmm. where I studied um, economics, and I also did my master's in economics. I hear you're one of the few that have uh, staying at Harvard. Yes, I went to the Kennedy School of Government to do public finance. Equally, I went to the IMF Institute in Washington, D.C. to study public finance management. And public service, you did go into when you came to Gambia. You worked at the Ministry of Finance at some point. And I understood every liter and every inch of almost all the priceless commodities that came into Gambia were under your portfolio at some point. Very true, and um, when I came to the Gambia, I wasn't motivated by working for the private sector. It was more impact driven. I came home because I wanted to make an impact. I came home because I wanted to be part of the change that will make this place better. So public sector was my calling. And yes, at the Ministry of Finance, as a macroeconomist, I did quite a lot of work, especially in oil importation and pricing. And in oil importation, we took over the national importation, and no, com country, um, no company in the country was importing. It was the government who was importing on their behalf. So I did the trading internationally to get product, and equally, I did the pricing locally to give a pump price so that there was price stability in the market in the medium term. Will that not be called uh, price control? Oh no, not at all, because petroleum is a strategic product that runs across all aspects of the economy. And if government really wants to tame inflation, there has to be some consideration. And the consideration was we made sure that there was adequate margin for dealers and importers, but equally there was price stability, which gives the economy visibility going forward. Working for government, how long were you there? I, uh, I understand uh, later on the private sector had a major influence over importation, uh, even exploration at the moment of petroleum products in the Gambia. Well, I worked for about three and a half, four years, and um, I didn't leave because I wanted to, but the situation was untenable whereby the President of the Republic then, quote unquote, I wouldn't say he saw me as a threat, but believe that I was loyal to other countries other than Gambia, and um, his paranoia led to me leaving the public service. Is that where your dislike, if you will, disdain for him began? I am not prejudiced. I don't have a dislike for him. I have a dislike for what he does and what he represents. As an individual, I don't have a problem with him at all, whatsoever. But everything that he represents and stands for goes against the grain of dignity, morality, and being a good human being. Then you left the public service, you came to the private sector. With your wealth of experience, now that we have University of the Gambia, you know, we are producing reporters, journalists, lawyers, uh, medical expertise, of course, economists as well. Did you ever think of venturing, uh, lecturing and impacting the next generation of Gambians through UTG? I cannot 
and I dare not. I'm not an academic. See, I think in Gambia, people loosely use academia, and it's not fair to the students. Mm -hmm. I am not trained to teach. Mm -hmm. So I will not venture out to teach, but notwithstanding, I'll try to be a good mentor and a coach, a life coach for would-be economists and other young people who are trying to do great things in this country. But I will dare not go to the university to be a lecturer. But you would go uh, and have sessions if it were needed and or interact with the students if it were needed and uh, spend an hour, two, three in an auditorium filled with such like-minded young people. Oh, naturally, I do that all the time and periodically as a consultant, I'm contracted by the MDI to do classes okay. on fiscal management, fiscal operations, moni um, monetary policy, issues of interest to professionals, people who are already working, and these are conducted by the MDI. And many a times my services are contracted to come and share knowledge experience, but I will not venture into the academic realm as a lecturer, no. Going back, you trained as a public servant, as a civil servant, and uh, such services are desperately needed in the Gambia. Are you not going to throw your heart into central government? Again? Not now. I'm not interested. Reason being, I would love to be part of a civil service that has gone through civil service reform. I would love to be part of a civil service that is politically free, and I would love to be part of a civil service that is very robust, buoyant, and have a security of tenure. And these things are not present today. Therefore, I don't think I will meaningfully impact the civil service if I were to go that round or that area. We'll take a second break here. When we come back, last words with Nyang Jai. Stay with us. Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa. Welcome back to Harona with my guest Nyang Njai. Uh, Nyang, we have gone through a lot as a country. A lot of people gave up hope. A lot of people left the shores of the Gambia and we were just dispersed everywhere around the world. Most of our professionals left um, to the World Banks and the IMFs and the UNs and other international agencies and all private sector around the world. People like you stayed. Why? Amidst all that hardship and such tight-fisted political environment. Well, like Jesse Jackson always say, keep hope alive. I'm a tenacious and resilient person, meaning I just don't give in and I just don't throw the towel. It's been a hostile environment. It has been an environment that has costed me a lot, both in terms of my life, livelihood, and properties. But notwithstanding, Gambia is worth way, way more than that. And I think come December 1st, 2016, we all yearned for greater and better days. But truth be told, the Gambia I live in today is not what I bargained for when I joined that queue on that hot sun of December 1st. Did you see it coming, December 1st, that that change was imminent, that it would have happened then? Well, the only constant in life is change. And the writing was on the wall for the brutal brute to exit and draw the curtains. Unfortunately for him, it came in a very unceremonious manner for him, but the average Gambian knew that time was up because we were just sick and tired of being sick and tired and the only thing left for us is to either live as dignified people or continue a life of servitude under him, which we didn't agree and the consensus amongst the majority of Gambians was for change and change was effected. That change and what you bargained for, gauging it on a scale of 10, what would you say? I mean, let's focus on two fronts only, political 
and the economy. Because this is, you, you are a very enthusiastic political analyst and you're interested in politics. This is obvious from your videos and your exposés that we follow very often. Uh, but economy, because this is your professional uh, uh, area of uh, specialization as well. These two fronts, do you think, on a scale of 10, 0 to 10, how are, you, how are we doing as a country? Well, if, you look at in, if you're looking at the indicators, Gambia is doing better. Why? Because we have tamed the budget in one front the, on the area of deficit financing. So the budget hasn't shrunk much, but our need for public borrowing, especially domestic borrowing, has gone down. And this has impacted interest rates and consequently borrowing rates for the private sector. So the crowding out effect that was very eminent and very dominant during the JAMA days, it's dissipating slowly. But notwithstanding, there are key things in terms of economic reforms that are missing. Fiscal consolidation, which is very important. We need some debt legislation whereby we have a legislated debt ceiling that Gambia cannot contract more than X percentage of debt on an annual basis and that we need it to be a law, not a discretion. We also need strong fiscal management to complement our monetary policies to make sure that the macro imbalances we saw in the economy during JAMA days will be or will become a thing of the past. So yes, the economy is doing better, but the expectations of Gambians are not met because it's not only about indicators, but the bottom line, pockets of Gambians, disposable income. And that's where government need to work more. Rationalize our tax system, streamline the tax processes, reduce the bureaucracy, curb corruption, and also have transparent procurement service, um, processes. Because public procurement is a thing that we are crying about today. I am not happy about many procurement processes in the public front. Well, the GPPA was set up exactly for that reason when it comes to procurement. But we've seen their audited report, which to many Gambians was disappointing as well, that they expected the gatekeeper to be better professional, more organized, and, and would put in place better systems. Uh, did you see that audited report? Yes, but that's not the problem. Laws are as good as the very people who implement them. There's been a lot of instances where laws are flouted in this country, and that's what we need to fight, and that's what we need to curb. I mean, you look at public contracts. Recently, there's been a lot of brouhaha about the Banjul Rehabilitation Project. Mm -hmm. No prejudice about the project, but I think their international best practices for such things and I think it would have been good to follow a minimum the FIDIC process and if you follow the FIDIC process you would have tended and allow anyone who wants to pre-finance to come up rather than just doing you know a one-on-one -on -one arrangement but these are the things that we need to force our government it's our government it's our resources we're the ones who are going to pay for them so we need to make sure we ask the government to do as we want. They are our proxies. They work for us. To the credit of this government, there is media freedom. Pluralism everywhere. We have about 35 radio stations. We now have five TV stations. And uh, political environment and climate, uh, uh, it's widening. Um, the... Um, IEC have registered two new parties. We know they're considering application of 30 more parties. Politically, how do you see this new government and its performance? To the credit of the, to the people, the people of this country ask for change and they have set the parameters that they want going forward. So yes, Gambia asked for political plurality and in this thing there's been a blossoming of the media space. There's tolerance within the media space, but still I think the government is having teething problems with voices of dissent. And it's that intolerance that they need to fight, tweak, and make sure that they appreciate the dissenting voices in this country. Because collectively we all want a better Gambia. But the only way we're going to get a better Gambia is if we don't have a voice that is monotonous, but we have voices that are divergent, but we have ideals 
that are monotonous, meaning we all want Gambia to head towards the land of prosperity, or path of prosperity, rather. Therefore, what we want is government to be more tolerant. But yes, we love the opening up of the space, both in terms of media, economic, and political space. They're all opening up, but that's what Gambians are yearning for. But government needs to tame and manage the expectations of Gambians, but equally, the polity, the people need to understand that rights do come with inherent responsibilities. And these responsibilities is to make sure that we live within the confines of the law. And what happened in town two weeks ago, mm -hmm. a protest torn riot, mm -hmm. is not something we condone. But equally, we will admonish the government to be very receptive towards giving permits to anyone and any organization that wants to express their rights, because these are fundamental rights entrenched in our constitution and is the role and responsibility of the security service to protect life, property, and individuals who are out on a procession to demonstrate or protest. I get all of that. A lot of people are saying the Gambians were bottled up for a long time and now we don't even know how to behave with the new democratic dispensation. And that is what is leading to all of these things, knowing that the freedom exists, but excessive freedom that is not curtailed. I beg to differ. I think there's two problems. The polity, the people, are yet to understand the power of their newfound freedom. And they're testing the limits. But equally, there are segments of society that need to be reorientated and be sensitized of what freedom is all about. Freedom has responsibilities, and a lot of people don't understand that. But more so, the very people who assisted Jame to really, really subjugate our rights for over 22 years need retraining. Police intervention unit, case in point. You can't expect people who for 22 years were known to be brutal mm. to expect them to police peacefully a group of people without good orientation, retraining, and retooling. The AK-47 must be out on the streets and we have more of buttons and shields as part of our community policing. I don't want to see a police in my streets with an AK-47 because AK-47 doesn't equate to the force that's coming out on the street on a na na um, daily basis. So having police checkpoints with AK-47 sends a wrong signal. And also, the word police force needs to be changed. Force is too aggressive. The Gambia police is enough. We need to get that word out of it, force. So there's some instrument of repression in the past that are still persisting in this new Gambia we're trying to build, and we need to do away with those. We're getting to the end of this interesting interview, which I, I would have uh, preferred to prolong a little bit more. But in your area of expertise, I know we have YEP, I know we have GAIPA, I know we have all these incubators, I know we have a lot of young people hungry to go into the business arena and become job creators instead of job seekers. How are you assessing the business climate overall and how can we make it easier for younger and younger people to now be employers and refuse to be employees? See, the first thing that a country should do is to equip its citizenry with skill set and toolkits. One thing this government, and when I say this government, I'm not talking about the current government, but all governments combined in the Gambia who fail to do is to understand demography. A country that boasts of a 56 to 57 percent youth population needs need good schools, good health care system, and good opportunities. All these three things are lacking, and still the government is yet to see that these are problems. So therefore, if we want good, sustainable entrepreneurs to come out, we should, from the cradle all the way to their last days, make sure that they're equipped with good education, access to good health care, and opportunities. And also, government try to open up the space. Open up, opening up the space means liberalizing. Liberalizing means quite a lot of things. I, for one, believe agriculture is a way out for this country. Poverty reduction can happen through agriculture, and I want to see the promotion of medical marijuana for export. I'm not talking about marijuana to be smoked 
hanky-panky in our streets, but allowed marijuana farming for exports because peanuts has been peanuts for a long time. And farming hasn't been a dignified profession because people bend their backs in the soil on the hot sun and still they're not making a decent livelihood. So government needs to venture into more what we call high value products or produce. And high value produce includes the cashews, but more so the marijuana. And we need to cultivate and export marijuana for medical use to the world. Everyone is doing it and Gambia will wait until it becomes a norm rather than be a force mover in this venture. Force mover in this venture. Um, if I hear you well, the climate itself is not as conducive, but how do we create roses that will grow out of concrete? Well, I think the biggest problem we have in this country is intolerance, and the intolerance comes for two things, lack of exposure and ignorance. We live in a global space, so we want citizens that are global. They think global, but act local and make sure that their context fits within. And that's global. Yeah. And this is one thing that's lacking in Gambia. We need to be very robust. We need to be very agile. And we need to be very, very aggressive to make sure that we play rather than be played in the global mix. Yes, Gambia is small. Like the Jamaicans will say, we're little but we're talawa. Meaning we're small people, but we're tough people. Gambia has an advantage of size. Yes, we are small. To some, it's a disadvantage. But for me, it's an advantage because it allows us to move Fast. and reposition faster than bigger countries. But we are yet to make advantage of this. You look at our proximity to Mali and our good navigability of our river. Why can't we have a dry port in Basse? Because the difference distance between Banjul to Dakar, Banjul to Basse is shorter than going from Bamako to Dakar. You save over 217 kilometers. That strategic advantage is yet to be monetized because we are not having a global outlook towards trading vis-a-vis -vis the environment we live in. Mr. Nyangjai, by way of last question, we don't have an economic council in this country or council of advisors who will be looking at policy outside of the fray of the civil service and advise, guide the presidency as well as uh, finance ministry and other players within government. If you were to be a member of such a council, what would be your advice to the state? Well, I think um, what Gambia needs is what you call an accelerated economic growth model. An accelerated model is to leapfrog. How can we do that? We have three areas that we need to focus on. We know that we have a high incidence of unemployment. Therefore, if you want to solve that problem, fisheries and agriculture are big. And in agriculture, forget about marijuana. Today, we can be the supermarket of Western Europe as it relates to fresh flowers. Because flowers in Western Europe are coming all the way from Kenya to Western Europe. Kenya, when we have a geo-proximity advantage of five and a half hours or four hours, four and a half hours to Spain, Gambia needs to reposition itself vis-a-vis -a, -vis a global player because of the fortunate advantage God gave us both in terms of climate and location. So an advice to this government is let's for once think out of the box and do away with business as usual and have radical shift and radical mindset of growing this economy and also making sure that we create stronger institutions and weaker men because discretion has been Gambia's malice and discretion has been what's putting this economy down because if an investor is to get something and the law says one, two, three, but yes, you are at the behest or the mercy of someone who has to decide that one, two, three, we have a problem. We need a rule-based procedural system whereby investors can just achieve what they want based on those rules and no discretion in the matrix of decision making. Thank you very much, Nyangjai. It's been a pleasure having you in Harana. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.